Going back to the album, uh, we talked about uh, you having having uh, socially conscious lyrics, but very personal as well. Is that is that an easy thing to do to to kind of uh, display your own soul in that way? I don't know if it's easy, but the trouble is audiences are too good. They right. know when you're lying. They know when nothing when something's not real, and so all you can do is um, sing the things that kind of mean something to you. And the other thing is you've got to sing it a hundred times a year if you're gigging. So it better be something you believe in. Um, so that's always the trickiest thing. That's the thing that takes the time is finding the songs that really mean something to you that you could cap happily or uh, at least sincerely sing endlessly, I think. Is there one song in particular on the record that you had this feeling uh, with? Yeah, I, well, there's this one song on the record called Arms. Mm. And it's, uh, it's a song about um, everyone thinks it's a really romantic song. It's, it goes on about, in these aching arms, I want to hold you, because there's nothing else that matters. And everyone thinks, oh, that's such a sweet kind of sentiment. But it was actually more about how I was traveling on the underground with three guitars, and my arms were killing me. Right. And thinking, God, I really need to get back home. And uh, you know, um, we want to be with the ones we love. But it was because my arms were killing me. OK. Yeah. And the, the record starts with an instrumental and then I believe track seven is an instrumental and then the final track, it concludes in that way as well. So was this thought of beforehand that you kind of wanted a, it, it to come full circle? Well, I had this melody idea when I was really young, when right. I first learned guitar, when I was about six. Really? And it was the intro piece, just literally the, I couldn't play the finger picking, but it's just the notes. Right. And. Uh, and I thought maybe I'd have that as my intro. And uh, I, I thought I'd put some of my kind of family heritage on there. So my father's Indian background, I have the Bollywood strings mm -hmm. on there. And my mother's heritage, I have the kind of traditional folk guitar. And I kind of try to throw them all together on the beginning and the outro. And, and uh, I had endless fancy names of what the songs would be called. And then I thought they all sound really pretentious. <laughs> track listing, number one, number seven, number 13. But what, what, what did you find so interesting about having these uh, instrumentals on there? Um, I was always drawn to soundtracks and, um, you know, there was this fantastic uh, composer and arranger called John Barry that I was really into and Ennio Morricone and, and sometimes it feels, um, I, I love the idea of playing um, instrumentally and and then it's, um, it keeps when you have vocals feeling fresh, you know. Mm. It's, it's more fun for me. In, in that way then, do you, does uh, visualization come into it when you write songs? Do you, do you yeah. see something? Do you have a vision? Uh, yeah, well for me it always takes, um, good music always takes me to another world. It takes me out for two hours if it's a long record, or 45 <laughs> minutes if it's not, you know, and I can, disappear from somewhere. I've always been the one that likes to disappear um, from wherever I am and uh, start dreaming. So music always does that to me. Yeah. If you, I don't know if you have, but um, when you listen back to this record now after, after it's been finished and uh, I suppose there's some separation, wh where do you dream off to? Well, we were driving through Holland through to uh, Germany last week and I heard my new song Wildfire on the radio. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a strange thing. Um, so sometimes it's quite nostalgic. It makes you think about, you know, I was in the car with all the guys in the band playing, well, that were on the record. And so it, it kind of takes us back to a year before when we were writing it or recording it. And, um, it takes me back to reminiscing about studio days and my arms killing me from carrying instruments. And well, uh, speaking of studio days, you said earlier you wanted to go back kind of to, to the way you did it with the first record, but then um, also it was a more collaborative effort with your band this time around. Yeah, I always liked the idea of, you know, um, all my favorite singers always had a really tight band, a tight mm -hmm. unit. If it was Stax or if it was Wrecking Crew or, you know, Elvis's TCB band, it was always like a brotherhood of guys. and. Um, and I kind of wanted that element. And now we can tour it with the same five or six guys and we can bring in strings when we need it. So I'll be playing at the Paradiso in May and we'll do something nice with strings, hopefully. But it will be the, the kind of brotherhood of the guys that made the record. I like that idea. 
Did it change the, the songwriting dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I was never keen on collaboration, you know, being a complete control freak. Mm -hmm. But I, th I actually find that the more you kind of collaborate with people that you care about and people you, you enjoy hanging out with, it actually makes it a lot better. And uh, the lyrics I always do myself because that's a difficult right, thing to right. dilute. But I think musically, people can take it into really interesting directions. So it was, was it, was it a, an easy thing to do to relinquish part of this control? Yeah, yeah, I think sometimes you just got to jump in. Right. I don't recommend that for everything. <laughs> but sometimes I think musically you should always um, you kind of explore and adventure and do all those things and see where it ends up, yeah. And then uh, when recording it, you were quite, I believe, adamant to, to do it analog and to do it, well, in a sense, old school. So. I just never liked the idea of doing music that involved one guy sat in front of a computer. You know, I liked the idea of, you know, all my favorite records were a bunch of people playing in a room and it was almost like a, sna a sonic snapshot right. of uh, one moment in time, three minutes of, you know, uh, these guys playing. And I always liked that, that side, you know, it, it kind of gets lost, that craft has kind of gotten lost. Um, and so I stick to my guns with that. Do you hear a difference when you listen to, to the radio and, for instance, your song comes on and then something else comes on, do you hear the, the way it's recorded? Yeah, all, you know, not everything. I mean, people are harking back to times where mm. music was a craft and it wasn't just one guy um, layering upon layering just himself on something. I, I mean, that works great. That's, you know, Beck's amazing at that. You know, there's people that do it really, really great. Mm. But for me, it was always capturing just a moment of people playing live. You know, I grew up in a house where we all played music together. And I think I try, I try to go back to that idea. In that sense, are the songs then also easier to translate to live settings because you kind of record it that way? Yeah, well, it's tough, you know, with a song like Arms where it has about 50 people playing on right, it. That's tough. Right. But, um, but at least the band is the band and we can, you know, it's fun when it's different every night and every gig seems to be really different. Mm -hmm. But at least you have the core where you know where you are. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing. And, uh, yes. Uh, the, the when in the process did the album title come into it? It came, uh, the title Low Desire kind of came about from God knows where. I have no idea. Um, I never really write lyrics down, you know, on paper in hotels or mm -hmm. at least not on this record. Um, and it just came to me while I was just singing the song. I was, you know, feeling like a gospel roots kind of vibe and it just kind of comes out and, you know. That's just a little bit of my passion in there. If, if you look back now at the record, as I mentioned before, after having some separation, do, do you feel that the title kind of encapsulates everything? Yeah, I think so. Um, like I said, this song is kind of about all the people that I, that I care about, all the people I've lost, and uh, they're very personal again, and it's all the, it's all the, uh, the passion I have in my life. So, mm -hmm. you know, Oh Desire kind of keeps it all together. And this thematic element of, of what you just mentioned, was this thought of beforehand or was it something you noticed as you were writing? Just as it, it kind of leads itself, you know, the best stuff always does. When you don't force stuff too deliberately or, and you're left to your own devices, I think that's the best stuff. Wildfire? Yeah. Um, where did that song originate? Where, where did it come from? Um, well, I, it kind of came very late in the process. Um, it's a song I wrote for my mother and, you know, like I've said this whole interview, the whole record was a very personal thing and mm -hmm. it's all the people uh, I care about. And so it was a song I wrote for her about, you know, even if even when they go away, they, um, they stay with you and, um, yeah, the lyrics kind of pick themselves. But these songs kind of happen quite subconsciously. You never really plan them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a song for my, mo my mother. Do you, every, every time you hear the song or, or play the song, do you revisit that emotion that you had when you wrote it? No, you kind of, um, emotions change every time you play the song. It depends where you are that day. Okay. But, um, and who you're singing in front of, if it's a thousand people or if it's 20 or one person, it's different all the time. But, um, yeah, always different. Okay. And, well, you've uh, released a video clip for it. Mm. Uh, what what was your thoughts about the, the video clip? Why uh, did you do it the way you did? 
Um, the video clip was done by Lucy Dyson, who lives in Berlin. She's a she's an amazing animator, mm. and uh, and I thought it'd be really nice, as opposed to having a guy walking down a street in all these videos, to have something where I don't even appear um, and just treat it as a piece of art. You know, mu I think music videos should go down that road for me now, mm. and uh, should be in their own entity. So I like the idea of stop. Um, stop frame animation right. and uh, she's great. And uh, why this uh, change for you? Well, why do you think now that, that the videos have to be kind of a, a work on Well, themselves? I just think it's, it's such a missed opportunity now. You know, with everyone's phone, you can check something out so quickly. You might as well ma make it as a piece of art as well, you know. You don't need to see uh, some guy's face for three and a half <laughs> minutes anymore, right. you know. Um, and I think, you know, we, uh, people need to be seeing interesting stuff. And she's an amazing artist, and hopefully we'll work together again. What do you want people to take away from the video, then? Do you want them to see it as something, well, obviously it's your song, but something separate? Then? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the videos I like, they, they always um, work by themselves, even without the music attached or the artist attached. And um, yeah, I think it should be seen as its own form of art itself. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure.